midst of this Me upon the strong rock by 
our service as we were experiencing the power of God moving in our midst and we experienced the miracle that God did, the second miracle in Sister Pat's life. And I told you, you know, as we were worshiping, it was a Wednesday night service and nobody wanted to leave. People just were gathered around the altar and we were testifying and we were just soaking up the blessing of God. And I told this church Wednesday night, yeah, God's been doing some great things. We've been finding the enemy. The Lord's going to fight our battles. But I want to assure you and remind you again tonight, church, we haven't even begun to fight. We haven't even begun to see the great things that is in store for how assembly of God. I believe very soon we're going to see God begin to pour out his spirit. He said, it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. It's power is not limited to just one generation. His power is not just limited to the Jewish people. But he said, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Oh, let the earth be silent. The wind cease to blow. Ever created people to wings. There's a new song being sung with a new melody. It's the blood bond, the church, the redeemed. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit, thou art welcome in this place. Holy Spirit, thou art welcome in this place. Sister Alyssa, if you'll go back to the camera for just a second. Sister Laura, I want you to come join me up here on the platform. God has been doing some miracles in people's lives. And there's more to miracles than just healings and provisions. But the greatest miracle of all is when God saves a soul from the gates of hell. But there's other miracles when God brings his hedge of protection upon his people. I want Sister Laura to come and she's going to tell you how God protected her this week. Uh, yesterday morning at work, uh, I was at a farm getting ready to unload some feed. But I had to walk back to see if I was going to hit this tractor that was in the way. And as I was walking, 
towards the back of my trailer, all of a sudden one of the tires blew. And it was almost like a bomb going off. I don't know if anyone knows what one of them tires sound like when they blow. But it did. And uh, of course it hurt my ears and my head. It still hurts. <laughs> But uh, all the stuff inside the tire, like the steel wire and things, could have came flying out and it would have hit me. And who knows what it would have done. But by the grace of God, that cap did not come off. Everything stayed inside and went out the side of the tire instead of straight at, out to my face. And where it was at, it would have been like being hit by bullets that steel wire and stuff then brother bill brought something up to me and i didn't think of it until now but them farms you know they're are gravel lots if it didn't blow straight out if it blew straight down it would have shot that gravel at me and with 120 to 130 psi it would have been like getting hit by bullets but by the grace of god not one thing flew at me not one thing just ear ringing and head hurting <laughs> that's it but i thank god that nothing came flying out that everything stayed right in that tire amen can you give the lord praise he is still in the miracle working business can we sing this chorus one more time holy spirit you are welcome Thou art welcome in this place, Holy Spirit, Thou art welcome in this place, Omnipotent Father of mercy. Oh, Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. Omnipotent Jesus, we thank you. Lord, you are indeed welcome in this place tonight. And Lord, as we gather together to study your word tonight, Lord, prepare our hearts. Lord, as we wait for your soon return, Lord, we want to hear you say, well done, good and faithful servant. But Lord, until you come again, help us to be watching. Help us to be waiting. Help us, Lord, to worship you in spirit and in truth, to lean not on our own understanding but in every way acknowledge you as you lead us and guide us and direct our path Lord in the pathway of righteousness for your name's sake we thank you Lord and we bless your name forevermore can you give the Lord a hand clap in Revelation chapter 5 and I want to bring you up to date from where we left off last Sunday night. In Revelation chapter 1, we see that the Apostle John had been imprisoned on the Isle of Patmos where he was visited by Jesus Christ himself. In Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, Jesus gives John a message, a designated message for seven churches in Asia Minor located in western Turkey. These seven churches also correspond 
respond to seven church ages. And these church ages have been taking place over the past 2,000 years since John was on the Isle of Patmos. Today, you and I are living in the final church age known as the Church of Laodicea. If you will remember, this is the church that Jesus said was neither hot nor cold, but they was lukewarm, that he was going to spew this church out of his mouth. The church of Laodicea thought that they were alive, but in reality, they were dead. They thought they were doing good works, but they were nothing but self-serving individuals. And there was a sense that Jesus himself was not even welcome to be in the church of Laodicea because we see in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, Jesus said to the Laodicean church, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Jesus is waiting for the opportunity to be welcomed back into his own house. Last Sunday night, we looked at Revelation chapter 4. The rapture had taken place. The redeemed of the ages were now standing before God at his throne. God was seated upon the throne. The church had been raptured away. It all takes place before the tribulation period begins. The saints of God were now seated around the throne of God. They've been robed in white. They have been crowned with a crown of righteousness. The angels were praising. They were magnifying God and saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And when the saints of God see the angels praising God, these angels do not know what it is like to be healed of sickness. The angels in heaven do not know what it's like to be bound in sin and forgiven of sin. They do not know what it's like to be delivered from the depths of sin. But yet the very angels in heaven have a praise to offer unto God and they praise him throughout the ages of time. And when the saints of God began to see these angels praising the Savior, the saints of God began to realize that they are in heaven not because of their own merit. They are there not because of what they have done in their own life, but they are only there because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ and the saints of God then take the crowns off of their head. They lay those crowns at the feet of Jesus Christ. They declare unto him, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they were and are created. And so tonight we continue into Revelation chapter 5 as John's vision of heaven continues. Revelation chapter 5 and let's begin with verse number 1. <laughs> The Bible says, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written, and on the backside sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. Verse 5, And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. The root of David hath prevailed to open the book and loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. 
and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beast and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. One split second in the moment and a twinkling of an eye after the trumpet of the Lord sounds and the dead in Christ are raised and you and I are caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. We are immediately going to be transferred from this life here on earth to be gathered around the throne of God in heaven. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you are going to be counted in that number that is going to be there. Last Sunday night we saw in the scripture that chapter 4 of the book of Revelation makes it perfectly clear that those individuals who have been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ are represented here as the 24 elders that are gathered around the throne of God. These people have been robed in white. They have been crowned and seated around the throne of God. I want us to remember also that we have not yet made it to Revelation chapter 6 where the tribulation actually begins. And so this is when Jesus allows the Antichrist to have access to planet Earth. We see, according to the word of God, the rapture is going to take place before the tribulation begins to happen. As we are worshiping God around his throne, suddenly he holds in his hand a scroll in his right hand. And on the scroll, it is written on both sides. It is sealed with seven seals. The scroll is important because the contents of the scroll contains the revelation of the chapters that follow that we will talk about the next couple of weeks. If you miss the rapture of the church, these are the conditions and the scroll under which life will be lived during the tribulation period on earth. And I assure you this evening, you will not want to be on planet earth during that time. Last Sunday night, I mentioned to you that you will not be able to run up to the throne of God and to jump up in God's lap because there's the flames of fire around his throne. But in Revelation chapter 5, we see that there is an opportunity to approach God on his throne. An angel begins to cry out and say, who is worthy to open the scroll? We see right here that there is an opportunity for someone to go up to the throne of God to take the scroll. But remember in John chapter 4 verse 5, John said that he saw the lightnings and the thunderings and the seven lamps of fire before the throne, which represents the sevenfold spirit of God. At this point in heaven, the events that are taking place, John said that he begins to weep because out of all the, the hundreds of thousands and the millions of people that is in heaven and in all the earth and in all the universe, not a single person was found worthy to open the scroll or even to look at it or approach the throne at all. No one felt worthy to approach God's throne, but there was only one who was able to approach God's throne. As John was weeping, one of the elders said to John, John, stop your weeping. Look, John, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the heir to David's throne, he alone is worthy to open the scroll and to reveal its seven seals. See, this is where we will see Jesus for the very first time. This is where we're going to look upon his face and see him in the total fullness of his glory and his awe and splendor and in his majesty that we could ever understand here on earth. The songwriter had it very correct when she wrote, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of his dear face, all sorrows will erase. So bravely run the race till we see Christ. 
John begins to see the most amazing sight as Jesus approaches the throne of God and he takes this seven sealed scroll in his hands. All of the angels, all of the saints of God and those four massive seraphim, they begin to fall down before the feet of Jesus as heaven begins to be filled with music and worship such as we have never heard before. John says that we're going to have harps in our hands. Millions upon millions of the now citizens of heaven are going to sing with voices that are glorified and resurrected. Not a single out of tune person is going to be heard but the choir is going to be majestic. The choir is going to be mighty. The choir is going to be glorified in a resurrected body. What is the song that we're going to sing at this time? The Bible says that we're going to sing a song that says thou art worthy. Why is it that Jesus is worthy? What, what makes Jesus worthy to, to receive this scroll from the Father's hand and to break the seals? First of all, it was only Jesus Christ that was able to be slain on the cross for the sins of this world. We were lost in sin. We were destined for destruction. We were destined to spend eternity in hell. But Jesus came. He stepped in our place and he took the punishment that you and I deserved for our sin. The prophet Isaiah Isaiah says in Isaiah chapter 53 verse 5 that he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. Jesus has resurrected his church from the death and the hold of planet earth. He, he is going to bring us into eternity because of the sin that was in our life. We were lost and dead in our sins. The Bible says in, Revel in, in Romans chapter 3 verse 23 for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God that sin comes with a great price Romans 6 23 says for the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord but on that day when we stand before God in his very presence and we see Jesus Christ approach the throne of God and take the scroll out of the right hand of the Father and we begin to worship him we're going to rejoice and declare as the Apostle Paul said in 1st Corinthians chapter 15 verse 55 O death where is thy sting O grave where is thy victory it is all passed away the former things are passed away and eternity has begun in the presence of Jesus Christ Jesus has presented us unto God not as lost sinners but as kings and priests making it possible for us to reign on earth with him during the millennial reign. We do not do one single thing to deserve this salvation. It was not done by our own good works, but we are saved only by the grace of God through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. He has made us new, and the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things are passed away, and all things are made new. He is the truth, and if you know the truth, you can be set free, and whom the Son sets free is free indeed. So as we look at what John is seeing in heaven, when we're looking at the angels and how they are, are worshiping him, John could not even estimate the number of angels. I, I'm assuming maybe their vocabulary was limited 2,000 years ago to be able to describe such a sight as what John saw. But it is possible, I believe, that there could have been hundreds of millions of angels at least. See, he talked about 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands upon thousands. They're around the throne of God, even the four massive seraphim. They're joining in the anthem of praise to Jesus Christ. The angels are leading us in the anthem which they declare to the Lamb, Jesus Christ. The seven things belong to him. First of all, all power belongs to him. Wealth belongs to him. Wisdom belongs to him. Strength and honor and glory and blessing, it all belongs to him. John declared in John chapter 3 that the Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. That the Spirit of God was placed upon him with 
without measure. Th that there is no limit to his power. There's no limit to his authority. That means that the same power that was in the beginning that created the heavens and the earth is in the very hand of Jesus Christ. The same power that, that brought healing to the blinded eyes is in the very hands of Jesus Christ. The same power that created this world and everything that is within it is in the hands of Jesus Christ. And it is that same power that was manifested in the very hands of Jesus Christ. It is that same power that brings healing to our lives today. It is the same power that keeps us safe in the shelter of his arms. It is the same power of God Almighty that has been working throughout the ages of time, throughout all eternity, to make a way for his church where there seems to be no way. Because he said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. There is nothing in this world that is impossible to God, for he is able to do exceeding and abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think. All we've got to do is call upon him, and he will answer us. He will hear us when we pray. He sees us when we cry. He wipes away the tears from our eyes, and he tells us it's going to be all right. So I don't have to worry. I don't have to doubt. I don't have to be in fear for God's got it under control and he's not given me a spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind so I can rest in his promise. I can stand on his word and I can know that we will overcome by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony in Jesus name. In a day when people are so willing so unwilling to acknowledge Jesus Christ as more than just a good man or a model example. We need to notice carefully what the angels of heaven, who by the way, they know him better than anyone could ever know him. We hear what they are saying. And we know that according to scripture, one day, whether they worshiped him or not, whether they believed in him or not, one day every knee will bow before Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter 2 verse 9 through 11 says, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That includes all of those people throughout the ages of time who have rejected Jesus Christ to come into their lives. Those people too will be forced to acknowledge that they have made a grim and tragic mistake as they are going to bow down before the Son of God. But the worship is going to be too late. What does that verse mean? That every knee will bow. Every sinner that's ever rejected Jesus Christ is going to bow down and declare that Jesus Christ is Lord. Every terrorist that has tried to come against the church of Jesus Christ, that has tried to stop the move of God, that has tried to stop God working in our midst, those people too will also stand before the very throne of God and bow down upon their face and declare that Jesus Christ is Lord. But the worship comes at a time when it is too late because they should have made that choice years ago. They should have made that choice while they still had the opportunity to accept Jesus Christ as Lord of their life but on that day of judgment they will bow before him and they will declare that he is Lord but it's going to be too late and he's going to say depart from me I never knew you and they will spend eternity in hell see the beginning of the tribulation period begins in Revelation chapter 6 in the previous chapters, we see Jesus take the scroll from the hand of God, the scroll which contains the coming judgments upon the seven-year tribulation period. In Revelation chapter 6, it unveils the apocalypse that is coming to take place on this earth. God has a specific purpose for the tribulation period. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, <clears throat> The Bible says 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. 
according to Daniel chapter 9 verse 24. There were six reasons that God is going to bring this tribulation period upon this earth. The first reason is to finish the transgression. This has to do with the nation of Israel and the Jewish people around this world. The Bible informs us that the people of Israel during the tribulation period are going to turn back to Christ through a great revival. And out of this revival is going to come 144,000 divinely protected, sealed witnesses who are going to then evangelize this world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The second reason for the tribulation is to put an end to sin. At the conclusion of the tribulation period, when Jesus makes his second return to this earth, when Jesus returns physically, Satan is going to be bound in hell. And God is going to deal with the issue of sin once and for all. The third reason for the tribulation is to make a reconciliation for wickedness. This means to atone for the wickedness of humanity. The fourth reason for the tribulation is to usher humanity into everlasting righteousness. God is going to bring his kingdom. He's going to set up his earthly kingdom here on this earth. And Jesus is going to reign for a thousand years. During that time, I heard one pastor say that because Satan is going to be bound for a thousand years, it's going to be just as easy to live for God then as it is to live for the devil today. Satan's going to be bound. He's not going to be there to bring temptation. He's not going to be there to bring up your past. But Jesus Christ is going to be reigning. The fifth reason for the tribulation period is to bring an end of the prophecies and the visions. Every promise that God has made in his word is going to come to pass. He will bring it to pass. He will do it in his own way. He will do it in his own time. And he does not need you or I to tell him how to bring it to pass. He will do it. And the final reason for the tribulation period is that at the very end, when it's all said and done, after the tribulation, after the millennial reign, after Satan is loosed for a season to go out and to tempt the nations of this world one last time to give people one final choice to choose between righteousness and evil. Satan's going to be destroyed. He's going to be cast into the lake of fire. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. Jesus Christ is going to be the holy and anointed one. He's going to be reigning as king of kings and lord of lords throughout the ages of eternity. So how does the tribulation period begin? It begins with the coming of the Antichrist. We will go over in just a moment when the Antichrist comes to power. But the moment the tribulation period begins is found in Daniel chapter 9 verse 27. The Bible says he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. In the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate even until the consummation that is determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Who is this he that Daniel is talking about. Someone is going to confirm a covenant. It's talking about the Antichrist. As soon as the followers of Jesus Christ, both the living and the dead, are raptured from this planet into the immediate presence of God, Satan is going to make his move. Jesus is going to break that first seal and he's going to send forth his imitation of Jesus Christ, the Antichrist. And during this tribulation period, when that covenant is signed and confirmed by the Antichrist, that is talking about a peace agreement concerning the nation of Israel and the nations of the Middle East. Has anyone heard of a peace agreement being signed between Israel and Mideastern nations? I assure you tonight that those peace treaties was not the peace treaty that we see in Daniel chapter 9. Because the peace treaty in Daniel chapter 9 is signed and confirmed by the Antichrist himself. Watch the nation of Israel. Look at what's taking place. The people of Israel, that there is a, an effort to overthrow their government and to get rid of Benjamin Netanyahu and, and to replace uh, the Jewish government with a Palestinian government. According to the word of God, it cannot happen. 
Jesus established Israel. He established Jerusalem to be the eternal capital. And the Bible is clear that this generation shall not pass away until all these things be fulfilled. There is something spectacular that happens when Israel begins to be attacked from an outside nation. We will talk about that here in just a moment. God will not allow Israel to be destroyed as we know it today. In the next few chapters of the book of Revelation, we're going to see God send three sets of divine judgments upon this earth. They are, first of all, the seven seals, which we will see in Revelation chapter 6. The seven trumpet judgments and the seven vile or the seven bold judgments. I want you to look now at Revelation chapter 6, starting with verse number 1. John is speaking here and he says, And when I saw the Lamb open one of the seals, and I heard as it were the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw and behold a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see, thou hurt not the oil and the wine. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And his name that sat on him was Death. And hell followed him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beast of the earth. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest for yet a little season, until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Verse 12, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and how there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? In this chapter we are introduced to what we call the four horsemen of the apocalypse. You do not want to be here when these first seals are broken. The first seal is broken and we see the first horse. It is upon this first horse that the Antichrist arrives on the scene. I want you to notice how the Antichrist arrives. He is riding on a white horse. He is carrying a bow, but there is no arrows. The Bible says that he goes forth to conquer. And so since he is bearing no arrows, but only a bow, it appears that the Antichrist is going to attempt to gain power through a peaceful means. He's going to be a peacemaker. After the rapture of the church, and we're gathered around the throne of God, and we're worshiping him, Jesus takes the scroll. He breaks the first seal. That's when the Antichrist comes to power. That's when Daniel chapter 9 comes to pass, and the Antichrist comes into this world as a peacemaker, a so-called peacemaker. Maker, and he signs a peace treaty with the Mideastern nations. The second seal is broken. The Antichrist's so-called peace is short-lived. 
when we come to the second horse. And during this second breaking of the seal, the Bible says that there is going to be a massive war. It is quite possible that this war is going to be a world war directed against the nation of Israel. In Revelation chapter 6 verse 4, And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. Where does the Antichrist power come from? It comes from Satan himself. During the seven year tribulation period on earth, humanity is going to be ruled by a triumvirate power from hell. You can also look at it as an unholy triune power, an unholy trinity of evil. We have it led by Satan who is the father of lies, the unholy father, the Antichrist who is the unholy son of perdition, the false prophet who is led by an unholy spirit. And Satan is going to be mocking the very power of God. In Ezekiel chapter 38 through 39, the Bible deals with the results of this second horseman. I believe this is going to uh, consider the power of Russia, a nation from the north and the east that is going to lead an attack of the nations against the nation of Israel. Right now in the national spotlight, in the international spotlight, the United States is still a defender of Israel. But I am noticing more and more that there is starting to be some kind of conflict going on between our nation and the nation of Israel. I'm thankful that we've had presidents for years that would stand with Israel. But I am not very sure how much longer that unity between our nation and the nation of Israel is going to last. Because during this onslaught of terror, during the tribulation period against the nation of Israel, the Bible is clear that there is not one single earthly nation that is going to come to Israel's defense. I had a Sunday school teacher many years ago who was a medical doctor. And he brought about several different scenarios of why that could take place. Because in the natural right now, we see that our nation is Israel's greatest ally. But during the tribulation period, Israel is going to stand alone. No other nation in this world is going to stand with Israel. So what does that mean for us here in the United States? Several things could be possible. Number one, it could be that the Bible is recognizing the United States and Israel as one. Right now, that could very well be the possibility. But it could also mean that the United States will one day turn its back upon Israel, which would be a very big tragedy for this nation itself. Because the Bible says, I will bless those that bless Israel. I will curse those that curse Israel. The final possibility that could be is that this nation would cease to exist altogether and be taken out of the equation. It is very possible there are nations of the world that do not like our nation. Russia, China, North Korea, they have all vowed that they would do everything they can to annihilate this nation. Russia has a, a couple of bombs, nuclear weapons they call the Satan 1, the Satan 2 bomb. One blast of one of those bombs can destroy a land area the size of Texas. Other nations have the e EMP bombs, which is electromagnetic pulse bomb. It can explode several miles up into the atmosphere, wipe out our entire electrical grid, wipe out our entire uh, communication system. We will never know what's going on, and any nation of the world could come in and bring havoc upon our nation. We're that close from it happening in this world today. In Ezekiel chapter 38, Verse 18 through 23, in the New Living Translation, the Bible says, but this is what the Sovereign Lord says when Gog, Gog, G-O-G, speaks of the nation of Russia. When Gog invades the land of Israel, my fury will boil over in my jealousy and blazing anger. I promise a mighty shaking in the land of Israel on that day. All living things and the fish in the sea, the birds of the sky, the animals of the field, the small animals that scurry along the ground, and all the people on earth will quake in terror at my presence. 
Mountains will be thrown down. Cliffs will crumble. Walls will fall to the earth. I will summon the sword against you and all the hills of Israel, says the sovereign Lord. Your men will turn their swords against each other. I will punish you and your armies with disease and bloodshed. I will send torrential rain, hailstones, fire, and bring sulfur. And this way I will make my greatness and holiness, and I will make myself known to all the nations of the world. Then they will know that I am the Lord. In Ezekiel chapter 39, verse 25 through 29 and the New Living, it also says, So now this is what the Sovereign Lord says, I will end the captivity of my people. I will have mercy on all Israel, for I jealously guard my holy reputation. They will accept responsibility for their past shame and unfaithfulness after they come home to live in peace in their own land with no one to bother them. When I bring them home from the lands of their enemies, I will display my holiness among them for all the nations to see. Then my people will know that I am the Lord their God because I sent them away to exile and brought them home again. I will leave none of my people behind and I will never again turn my face from them for I will pour out my spirit upon the people of Israel. I, the sovereign Lord, have spoken. When war begins to rage against the nation of Israel, God himself is going to come to their protection. It has happened before in recent history, over 40 years ago. In the 1960s, there was what was known as the, the Six Days War. The Palestinian forces were moving in in Israel. They were coming toward Jerusalem. But it is recorded in history that before they began to make their attack, Israel was outnumbered. They were able to even fire any shots. But every time the enemy began to fire, their weapons were failing. Their, their, um, their artillery was failing. And they were defeated because God himself manifested his presence. There was another time just a couple of years ago when the, the terrorist in Gaza was launching an attack against Jerusalem. And every time they would fire their rockets from Gaza into Jerusalem, those rockets would fail and explode somewhere out in the, the deserts of Israel. And one of the Muslims himself even said, the God of Israel causes our weapons to fail and miss their target. God still has a plan for the nation of Israel. He will not turn his back on his people. We come now to Revelation chapter 6, verse 5 through 6. We see the third horseman. The third seal is broken. And when this third seal is broken, the Bible says that there's going to be a global famine. In verse 5 and 6, when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see, thou hurt not the oil and the wine. When the second seal was broken, there was an all-out war against Israel. Historically, throughout the ages of time, when a war would break out, after that war, there would be a famine. And since this is going to be a global war, this is more than likely going to be a global famine. And so John is receiving from Jesus units of measurement or money in this passage. And the indication is that a person will have to work an entire day just to make enough money for food for that day. Imagine this. In some places, the minimum wage is $9, 10 $15 an hour. I don't know what it is here in Oklahoma. But imagine a, a, a person's wage is $15 an hour. They're working all day. So that enables them to make nearly $100. But every part of that daily paycheck is going to be used to buy barely enough food for that person for that day. What about the rest of their family? They're going to have to ration it. They're going to have to make it last. A few people are going to be rich. They're going to continue to get richer during this time. See, it's just like we're seeing come to pass today. A few people in the world want to be in charge of it all. Let me give an example. The United States government places a tariff on items coming from another country. 
that country gets upset and bent out of shape so they put a tariff on our experts and then we raise our tariffs against them and it goes back and forth and on and on and the cost of production goes up and the market values and the sale values continue to go up and the bills continue to get higher and higher but our paycheck continues to get smaller and smaller because more taxes keep coming out and we wonder how much further can it go sometimes it may seem to us right now that you know we have enough food here in the United States we think we have a surplus of food if you ask the farmers of southern Arkansas and northern Louisiana, they would tell you a different story because in the middle of their planting season, in the middle of the time when their, their, their crop should be reaching major production, the rivers flood and overflow and flood their fields and destroy everything they have worked for over the past few months. And it causes a food shortage. It causes the prices to rise and they have to pull food in from another location. But when a global war breaks out, global famine breaks out, where is the food going to come from? The fields will have been destroyed. The workers will have been killed. And food is going to be very scarce. When the fourth seal is broken, we see the fourth horseman. This rider of the fourth horse brings death on a massive scale. In Revelation chapter 6, verse 7 through 8, and when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And his name that sat on him was Death. And hell followed with him, and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beast of the earth. I want us to remember this is only the very beginning of the tribulation period. The four horsemen have caused one-fourth of the world population to cease to exist through wars, through hunger, through famine, through animal attacks. According to current population statistics, this would represent the death in a short period of time, the death of 1.9 billion people. To put that in perspective, some of you may remember what took place in World War II. It caused the death of about 60 million people. The deaths of World War II is only a small fraction compared to the casualties that's going to be caused by the four horsemen of the apocalypse. We now come to the fifth seal. Jesus breaks the fifth seal. We see that there were saints of God that were martyred during the tribulation. There are going to be people that are saved during the tribulation period. The Bible tells us that there are going to be saints that are killed during the tribulation. They came to know Jesus Christ. Maybe some of them had never heard the gospel. But we also know that there's going to be 144,000 Jewish witnesses that evangelize this world. And there's going to be a great revival take place during that tribulation. In Revelation chapter 6, verse 9 through 11. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants and also their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. As a result of an all-out attack, possibly by the nation of Russia against Israel and its subsequent annihilation, God is going to come to the defense of Israel and is going to wipe away its enemy. And because of the results of that battle, there is going to be 144,000 spirit-filled Jews that are going to be sealed and anointed by God himself. And they're going to begin a ministry evangelizing this world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there will be a revival such as what this world has never seen. But it's going to be a costly life. It's going to be a life that's going to cost them their very life. When they come to know Jesus Christ, they will be killed. Knowing Jesus Christ during the tribulation period is going to bring death from the power of the Antichrist. And so as a result of this battle, 
the Antichrist is immediately going to attack these believers who will pay for their faith with their own lives. There are going to be people who were saved during the tribulation period. I believe the people who were saved are going to be mostly those who have never heard the gospel before. Many of these people who became Christians during the tribulation, they're going to die for their faith very soon. Now, I know there are some that may say, well, they're not going to get saved now, but they'll plan on getting saved during the tribulation period. I kind of wonder about that. Because if they cannot live for Jesus Christ now, as we have the freedoms that we experience here in the United States, and you have the freedom to worship God as you please, then how in this world do they expect to live for God and commit their life to Jesus Christ when they're going to be faced with uncertain death just for saying the precious name of Jesus Christ? If you cannot live for Jesus Christ now, how can we have the nerve to live for Him in the tribulation period? We can make the choice and we can serve God now and, and live our life until we die and, and go to heaven or be caught up in the rapture and spend eternity in heaven. Or many people today, they reject Christ. They take a chance of, of getting killed and going to hell. Even if they survive the tribulation long enough to accept Jesus Christ, then they're going to be killed for being a Christian if they get caught. That's why it's so vitally important that people come to know Jesus Christ now before it is too late while God's grace is still available. We see the breaking of the sixth seal. And when that sixth seal is broken, a catastrophe begins to take place around the entire planet. Revelation chapter 6 verse 12 through 17. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casts her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? I don't know if all of you are aware of it, but one of the largest earthquakes in the history of the United States affected the very spot where you and I are seated and standing tonight. The New Madrid earthquakes were the biggest series of earthquakes in American history. The epicenter was in the central Mississippi Valley, but was felt as far away as New York City and Boston, Montreal, Canada, Washington, D.C. And the reason history does not record anyone in Oklahoma feeling that earthquake is because Oklahoma was Indian territory, and we did not have this area developed at that time. But there is history in Fort Smith, Arkansas, that buildings were damaged in Fort Smith because of that particular earthquake. President James Madison and his wife Dolly record what they experienced during that earthquake as they were living in the White House. Church bells were being shooken, shaken in Boston, Massachusetts from December 16, 1811 through March of 1812. There was over 2,000 earthquakes in the central Midwest. But in the boot hill of Missouri, there was 6,000 to 10,000 earthquakes registered in that small region. New Madrid is located near the junction of the Ohio and the Mississippi River. In the known history of the world, there is no other earthquake, series of earthquakes that have lasted so long or produced so much evidence of damage as was in the New Madrid earthquakes. History records that during one of these series of earthquakes, there were boaters on the Mississippi River. They report the river actually ran backwards for several hours. The force of land upheavals created lakes. It drowned the inhabitants of Indian villages, turning the river against itself to flow backwards. 
It's been reported that the skies turned black during the earthquake, so dark that lighted lamps would not make a difference. The air smelled bad. It was hard to breathe. We have been told for many years that the earth is again going to have a massive earthquake at some point in time. We see in history that earthquakes have been so severe that ash and smoke seem to blot out the light from the sun. But the Bible assures us that there is a large earthquake that is going to come. And during that earthquake, the sun is going to be as dark as sackcloth. It's going to be blackened. It's going to be a total worldwide eclipse. There's going to be worldwide panic. Yet at the same time, the fear that is being driven from all of this apocalyptic event is still not going to drive people to repentance before God. Instead, they're going to be like Adam and Eve. They're going to be guilty of sin, running to try to hide from God, trying to kill themselves, trying to get the mountains and the rocks to fall upon them, but death will run away from them. There is only one way that humanity can escape these apocalyptic events. We must repent of our sins before it is too late. Jesus Christ is coming soon. He will usher in his church. There will be a time where we will spend eternity with Jesus Christ. He could come this very day. He could come before we get together for another service. He could come before we leave the sanctuary. The Bible is clear. We must watch therefore for we know not what hour our Lord does come. Can we stand together across the sanctuary? Father, we come to you tonight in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray that you would search our hearts. Dear Lord, anything in our life that would keep us out of your will, any ungodly thought, any sinful action, any ungodly word, anything, God, that would keep us out of your will, Father, we pray for your forgiveness. God, that you would lead us, that you would guide us and direct us in the pathway of righteousness for your name's sake, Jesus. Lord, we want to be ready for that day when you come, when the trumpet of the Lord sounds and the dead in Christ rises first and we who are alive and remain are caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Lord, help us to be watching. Help us to be waiting for your coming is very soon. All across the sanctuary tonight, can we just come together around this front and let's just shut ourselves in with God and let the Holy Spirit speak to our hearts. Let God do a work in our life as we draw closer to Him, as we prepare our hearts for His soon return. Jesus Christ is coming soon. If we do tonight that Jesus Christ was coming, if we knew that at the strike of midnight tonight that the trumpet of God was going to sound, what would we want to do? What would we want accomplished in our life? We should be living like that every moment of our life. For we do not know the day nor the hour that Jesus Christ is coming. But we must be watching. We must be waiting. We must be looking up and rejoicing. For very soon, our redemption is drawing nigh. Can we pray together? What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see when I look upon his face the one who saved me by his grace when he takes me by the hand and leads me through that promised land
thank you tonight, Lord, for your presence that we have felt in this place. Lord, that is the day that we are looking forward to, to hear you say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Father, I pray that you will help us as your children to be watching and waiting. Lord, that you would continue to prepare our hearts to be ready for your soon return. For Lord, we believe your coming is very soon. And Lord, we want to be ready. We want to hear you say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And Lord, I pray that you would go with us now. Lord, that you would guide us, that you would direct us. Lord, that you would lead us, Father, in the path of righteousness for your name's sake. And Lord, Lord, we give you praise in Jesus' name, and we bless your name forevermore. Hallelujah to his name. Can you give the Lord a hand clap of praise? He is worthy of all the praise. Christ will rise and we will rise as well to meet the Lord in the air. 